I'm Mitch Weiss. And I'm Martha Hamilton. And we are here today and we are excited to be telling you stories in our living room. Now, we love to read and we love to write. In fact, we've written a lot of books. However, more than anything else, we love to tell stories. Everyone tells stories. If something funny or exciting happens to you, what's the first thing you want to do? Tell someone about it. Yeah, and kids just like you are great storytellers. We know because our life's work has been teaching kids just like you how to use their voices and their faces and hand motions and body language to tell great stories. Our favorite stories to tell are the old ones from around the world. Now, we can't tell the stories the way a person from another country or culture would, of course, so we tell them in our own voices. And if you find a story told on one side of the world, chances are you'll find that same story or one that's incredibly similar on the other side of the world as well. We may not look or dress or speak the same language as someone from another culture, but our common stories remind us we are much more alike than we are different. Now we'll tell the stories using our voices and our faces and our hand motions, and you will use your imaginations to create the pictures in your minds. Sometimes we'll ask you to join in, and we hope you will if you like. We've included some video of us telling to a live audience the most fun of all. The first story we're going to tell you comes from our book, How and Why Stories, World Tales Kids Can Read and Tell. These are all stories made up long ago by people when they wondered about things such as, why do tigers have stripes? Why does the sea taste salty? Why does the moon have dark spots? Now, if you have ever wondered what causes thunder and lightning, you wouldn't be alone. People all over the world have for ages, and they made up lots of great stories, especially to explain the sound of thunder. For example, a long time ago, if there was a big clap of thunder, one person might have looked up and said, oh my goodness, I think a gigantic rock must have just fallen off of a wagon up in the sky. Someone else might say, no, no, no. It's the giants who live in the sky having a big fight. And another might argue, whoa, the sky people must be moving very heavy furniture today. Now, when I was a kid, I heard, and some of you might have heard this as well, that it was the angels bowling in the sky. Many Native American people tell stories about a gigantic bird called a thunderbird that when it flapped its wings, that caused lightning, and its voice was the sound of thunder. We're going to tell you a story that comes from Nigeria that has a very clever explanation for both thunder and lightning. As you listen to the story, see how the people who made it up want to make sure that you knew which came first, lightning and then th or th Whichever it is, you'll know by the end of the story. Long ago, thunder and lightning did not live in the sky as they do today. Instead, they lived in a small village right here on the earth. Thunder was a mother sheep. Her son, Lightning, was a young ram who had a terrible temper. Whenever he grew angry, he'd tear through the countryside, burning houses, knocking down trees, and setting the farmer's fields on fire. His mother would then yell at him to stop. Her booming voice was so loud that the houses in the village shook. People held their ears. Babies cried. Dogs, Dogs howled. howled. But Thunder's deafening yells only made things worse. It got Lightning angrier. He'd tear through the countryside and set more things on fire. And his mother would then yell even louder. When the people complained to the king, he made Thunder and Lightning live in the bush, far away from everyone else. But this did not solve the problem. Lightning still couldn't control his terrible temper. He set the trees in the bush on fire, and the flames soon spread to the farmer's fields. And even though they were further away, his mother's booming cries still sounded almost as loud. 
So once again, the people complained to the king. Oh, the king was furious. He banished thunder and lightning from the earth and forced them to live up in the sky, where lightning's fire could not harm anyone, and his mother's loud yells could not be heard. At first, it seemed as if this punishment had worked. Things were quiet for a while. But then, one day, there was a storm like no one had ever seen or heard before. Great streaks of lightning struck the earth and set things on fire. And after every flash of light, there was a loud booming sound. The people soon realized that it was just the young ram lightning and his mother thunder up to their same old tricks, but now in the sky. And so it is to this day. Whenever there's a thunderstorm, first you see a flash of light. It's the young ram lightning who's grown angry and thrown his bolts down to the earth. The booming sounds that come afterwards are his mother's yells. And to this day, her cries are so loud that they can make the heart of anyone, young or old. <gasps> Skip a beat. They cause babies to cry. Dogs to howl. Children to pull the covers up over their heads. Or run to sleep in their parents' bed. We all have two sides of our brain. The right side is the creative side that loves to make up fictional stories with no concern for whether or not they're true. The left side is the more factual, the more scientific side that says, wait a minute, why is it that lightning always comes before thunder? Now, it's important for us to exercise both sides of our brain. So in our book of how and why stories, if there really is a scientific explanation for something, we always put that at the end of the story. Lightning is a massive surge of electricity inside of a cloud. Now, the electricity that runs through our houses is very powerful, but the electricity inside of a lightning bolt is a million times greater. Now, lightning can travel around one cloud, it can jump to another cloud, or can go straight down to Earth. On the average, just in the United States alone, lightning strikes cause over 10,000 forest fires a year. There is a lot of heat along a lightning bolt. When that heat expands, it explodes, causing the sound that we know as thunder. So lightning comes first and causes the thunder. And whoever made this story up long ago wanted others to notice that. So in the story, it's the young ram lightning who sets fires, and then afterwards, his mother who yells at him to stop. Now, I want to tell you something that happened to me when I was 13 or 14, maybe. I was in eighth grade. I had a very little brother and sister. They weren't even in school yet. And I often babysat for them. And whenever there would be a thunderstorm, they'd get really scared. And one day I was babysitting for them and a big storm came up. And right before that, I had done a report in my science class in front of the class on thunder and lightning. And so suddenly I knew how I was gonna distract them. I said, oh, wait a minute, this thunder and lightning, it's really no big deal, you know. In fact, I, your big sister, am a magician. I can tell you when the next thunder will come. They said, really? Of course, don't doubt me, just watch. Now, I had noticed that the storm was getting very close. So when there was another flash of lightning, I waited a couple seconds and then I said, now, and boy was I lucky. Because right then there was one of those heart stopping claps of thunder. And my little brother and sister looked up at me and said, wow. You really are a magician. I said, of course, I told you so. I was feeling quite confident and pleased with myself and I wasn't expecting what came next, which was, show us more tricks. We want more tricks. 
I didn't have any more tricks. That was the end of my magician career right then and there, unfortunately. But it did leave you with a good story to tell. Hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, maybe it was the beginning of my storytelling career. The next story is an African-American folktale that would be perfect for telling at night around a campfire. So use your imagination. Wait. We'll help. On a cool autumn night, a man was walking along a lonely country road on his way home when a big storm blew up. Lightning flashed, thunder boomed, the rain soaked his clothes, and all the wind swirled so hard that man could barely walk. Uh, he realized he was going to have to find a place for, to stay for the night because he would never be able to make it home in that kind of weather. The only shelter for miles around was an old deserted house just down the road. People said that, that house was haunted. When the man thought of all the stories he'd heard about that house, the hair on the back of his neck began to rise. But he didn't really have a choice. So he hurried toward the house as quickly as he could. He walked through the overgrown front yard and up the rotten uh, front porch steps. He put his hand to the door handle and opened the door. He stepped into the hallway. But just then, bam, the door slammed shut right behind him. Oh, it's going to be a long night. The house sure was big and dark. There were spider webs everywhere. He made a fire to shake the chill that he had gotten from the cold rain. Then he took a newspaper out of his pack, sat by the fire, and started to read it. As he sat there reading, he heard a noise that, that gave him a starting, looked up to see a strange black cat staring at him with fiery red eyes, and he thought to himself, this is no ordinary house cat. He decided it was best to ignore it, so went back to reading his paper. When the man finally got the nerve to look up again. There, there were, were two sets of eyes staring at him. The second set belonged to a huge black cat, as, as big, big as, as a dog. dog. That first cat turned toward the other one, pointed right at the man and said, what do you think we should do with him? Now that's really fun. If you'd like to join me, Please do. First, get your evil eyebrows going. And then we're all going to say, what do you think we should do with them in your most evil voice? Okay, let's try it. What do you think we should do with them? And the huge black cat replied, Wait till Whalem Balem comes. <laughs> Want to do that laugh with me? It's a lot of fun. Come on, let's all try it together. <laughs> man kept on reading the newspaper, although by now his heart was racing and oh, his hands were shaking. Again, he felt more eyes upon him. And when he looked up, the others had been joined by a third fierce-looking cat. As, as big, big as a goat! That first cat turned toward the others, pointed right at the man and said, What do you think? we should do with him. Wait till Willem Balaam comes. <laughs> oh, again, the man buried his head in the newspaper, although by now he was so frightened that, oh my goodness, he couldn't even make out any of the words, and he broke out into a cold sweat. It was a long before he felt more eyes upon him, and he looked up, and the others had been joined by a forced, fearsome cat. 
as big as a horse. Again, that cat turned toward the others, pointed right at the man, and joined me. He said, what do you think we should do? Wait till Willem Bellum comes. <laughs> now that man, he had no idea who or what Willem Bellum was, but he knew one thing for sure. He did not want to meet him. He jumped up, rushed out of the house, and he was far down the road. He called back, when Willem Bellum comes, you tell him, I couldn't wait. That man tore on down the road like, like a streak, streak of, of lightning. And if Wellen Balaam ever did come, you can be sure that that man wasn't there. Now, I'll bet that a lot of you want to ask, who's Wellen Balaam? Or what's Wellen Balaam? There's no answer. The story leaves it up to your imagination. Every time we tell the story, kids will say, I'll bet that Willem Balaam was a ghost. Or I thought that Willem Balaam, when he showed up, he was going to be a big monster. Or that Willem Balaam was the owner of all those cats. Or, and a lot of kids say this, I thought that Willem Balaam was going to be an even bigger cat. Maybe a cat as big as a house. Or as big as a mountain. There's no right answer. You decide. The story leaves it up to you. We have been telling stories together for 40 years. 40 years? It seems impossible. But, but it's, it's true. true. The proof is in the pictures. In addition to Mitch and Martha, we also have another name. Beauty, Beauty and, and the, the Beast, Beast Storytellers. Storytellers. Now we chose that name when we first started because it's an old, old story. But we never, ever tell our audiences which one is the beauty and which the beast? Mitch! This has been going on for 40 years. About 20 years ago, we wrote a book called Noodlehead Stories, World Tales Kids Can Read and Tell. Now, these are not stories that we made up. They're old folk tales from all around the world, our particular versions of them. Now you might be wondering, what's a noodlehead? Well, a noodlehead is a fool, someone who's not using their brain very well. It could be any of us. We all do foolish things. We all have our noodlehead days. So who out there has ever done something foolish? Go on, raise your hand, come on. Whoa, that's, that's a lot, lot of hands. hands. Glad you're being honest. Although we all do foolish things, no one is ever as foolish as the noodle heads in these stories. It helps us laugh at our own foolishness. Now, this picture is from a long time ago, but look at the kids laughing at us telling a noodle head story. Actually, we could have written a whole book about foolish things that we've done. Truthfully, though, I am far ahead of Martha in the noodle head department. Uh, I could tell a lot of stories, but uh, okay. Once, Mitch locked the keys in the car, but it was worse than that. He had left the car engine running, and we had been in a restaurant for a couple hours. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. At least the car was locked and no one could steal it. Oh, you got me there. But what happens is that when we tell a foolish thing that we've done to someone else, they will often tell us something they've done that was worse. So we told that story about Mitch at a school once at a big assembly and a teacher raised her hand and said, I did that, but it was worse. I locked my keys in the car, the car was running and my baby was in the car. Everything ended up being okay, don't worry. Uh, but we told her story at another school a while afterward, and another teacher very sheepishly raised her hand and said, I did that, 
but it was worse. I locked my keys in the car. The car was running. My baby was in the car. And as I slammed the door, my skirt got stuck and I couldn't move. Now, we haven't heard any worse than that, thankfully. The folks who published our book of Noodlehead stories made a noodlehead from a colander or strainer. You know, the thing you use to drain water after you've cooked noodles and very long rubber bands. Mitch looked great in it, don't you think? By the way, we did not make up the word noodlehead. In these old stories, fools were often referred to as noodles or noodleheads. It's a funny word. You can't insult someone by calling them a noodlehead. If you're watching this with someone, turn to them right now and call them a noodlehead. Go ahead, come on. We'll wait. <laughs> See? It's impossible. Now, we have loved telling these old Noodlehead stories over the years. And one day, we took a tiny idea from one of these stories and created our own original story. We're going to tell you that one now. It's about dreams. Now, I bet all of you have had this experience. You're asleep and you wake up from a dream and you think, oh my goodness, did that really happen? But very quickly, you kind of shake your head and say, oh no, that was just a dream. Ah, but not if you're a noodlehead. Here's the story. It's called Nine, Nine Noodlehead, noodlehead Nightmares. Nightmares. 20. Mr. Noodlehead, who was exhausted, climbed into his bed next to his wife, Mrs. Noodlehead. He, he, he was dismayed to find that his pillow was missing. <laughs> Darn it, dear. I lost my pillow. Although they searched and searched, the Noodleheads could not find the pillow anywhere. It had actually fallen right underneath the bed. But since they were Noodleheads, they didn't think of looking there. Not to worry, dear. I have an idea. Mrs. Noodlehead took a glass jar, filled it with feathers, put the lid on tight, and handed it to her husband. Try this jar for a pillow, dear. Those feathers will make the jar nice and soft. Brilliant! Yes. <laughs> now that's going to happen quite a bit in the story, so whenever I get that incredible look on my face, let's all say brilliant, too. Let's try it. Come on. Brilliant. And I have to say also that uh, even when we tell that for kindergartners, there's always this like, no, that's not going to work. Mr. Noodlehead put the jar where his pillow usually was and put his head on the jar. It was extremely uncomfortable, but he was so tired, he soon fell fast asleep. But in the middle of the night, he woke up and called out, ah! Mrs. Noodlehead, of course, was awakened and cried, What's the matter, dear? Oh, what a nightmare. I dreamed I was walking barefoot and got a big splinter in my foot. Oh, I didn't know dreams could be so dangerous. Neither did I. We better wear our boots to bed to protect our feet. Brilliant. <laughs> From then on, just in case. So I'm oh, say, some people have heard the story. They know what to do. All so whenever day. I say from then on, we're all going to say just in case. Let's try it again. From then on, just in case. Mr. and Mrs. Noodlehead always wore their boots to bed. On the second night, Mr. Noodlehead began to shake so violently, the bed started to rock back and forth. Awakened by the wiggling, Mrs. Noodlehead cried, what's the problem now, dear? Oh, what a nightmare. I dreamed I was caught outside a blizzard. It's a good thing you woke up, dear. You might have frozen to death. How right you are. We had better wear our coats and hats and gloves to bed to keep us warm. Brilliant. <laughs> From then on, just, just in case. Mr. and Mrs. Noodlehead wore their coats and hats and gloves to bed. On the third night, Mr. Noodle had dreamed that a spark from the fire landed on their bed. He woke in a fright, jumped out of bed, and called out, FIRE! <laughs> Goodness gracious, dear! There's no fire here! Didn't you ever hear that story about the boy who cried wolf? If there ever is a real fire, I'm not going to believe you. I'm sorry, dear, but my dream the fire was real. We had better bring a big bucket of water to bed in case there's a real fire. 
And so it went. Every night, Mr. Noodlehead had another nightmare. As a result, they kept bringing more and more things into the bed. And although they kept searching for the pillow, they never thought of looking underneath the bed. On the fourth night, Mr. Noodlehead dreamed that he was being chased by a pack of wolves. From then on, just in case. They always let their three large dogs, Spink, Spunk, and Skabooch, sleep in the bed to protect them. On the fifth night, Mr. Noodle had dreamed that he was caught outside in a rainstorm. From then on, just, just in case. case. You guessed it, they always brought their umbrellas to bed. <laughs> on the sixth night, Mr. Noodle had dreamed that he went for a walk in the forest and got lost. He hadn't brought any food or water with him. He soon grew hungry and thirsty. From then on, just in case, they always bought a large tray of food to bed. On the seventh night, Mr. Noodle had dreamed that a mouse ran across his feet. From then on, just in case, they let their three cats, Messy, Bessie, and Tessie, sleep in the bed to chase away any rodents. The bed was now cramped and crowded. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Noodlehead could barely move for fear of knocking over the tray of food or the bucket of water. Or poking one another with their umbrellas. Oh, there were, the sheets were dirty from their muddy boots. They were sweating from wearing so many clothes. Oh, neither of them had had a good night's sleep in a week. Enough. No, no more nightmares. nightmares. But on the eighth night, oh. Mr. Noodle had dreamed that their house was hit by a tornado. From then on, just in case, they used thick ropes to tie themselves to the bed so the wind wouldn't blow them away. On the ninth night, Mr. Noodle had dreamed that their house was robbed. From then on, just in case, did they think of locking the doors? No, they wore scary Halloween masks to frighten away any thieves who might get in. The next morning, Mr. Noodle had sat on the edge of his bed exhausted. He was counting a few coins he had when one of them fell out of his hand and rolled underneath the bed. And when he bent down to pick it up, there was his pillow. That night, as Mr. Noodlehead climbed into their cramped and crowded bed, he wondered what nightmare he'd have that night. He took away that glass jar and put his pillow in its usual place and fell fast asleep. And when he woke in the morning, he said, Guess what, dear? I, I didn't have a nightmare last night. Oh, the only thing in the bed was you, me, blanket sheets and pillows. What a sweet dream. It, it must have been. That strange glass jar that gave me all those nightmares. Oh, I'll bet you're right, dear. And your sweet dream means that we no longer need all of these things in the bed. Let's take them out. Brilliant. And so they did. And after that, Mr. Noodle had had no more nightmares. <laughs> <laughs>Some of you may know that we now have a series of graphic novels about noodleheads. It's a collaboration we've been working on with Ted Arnold, the creative genius behind the Fly Guy series. Ted is a good friend of ours, and we shared that story that we just told you with him because we thought, my goodness, his sense of humor and his drawings are so perfect for noodleheads and wondered if he might be interested in doing a picture book. But much to our delight, he said, how about a series? The story we just told you became the inspiration for the first book in the series, Noodlehead Nightmares. Although the story we just told you was about Mr. and Mrs. Noodlehead, when we began to work on the series with Ted, he decided that they should actually be elbow macaroni, the kind you use when you make mac and cheese. I'm Mac. And I'm Mac. We're, We're Noodleheads. See in here? Nothing. Zippo. Nada. The books are based on old folk tales from around the world. So we do a lot of noodlehead research, looking through old books with stories about fools. And then some serious noodlehead investigation and research.
up with story ideas and send them to Ted. He comes back with his own ideas and then he works his magic. It is so much fun working with him. Ted is tall, as you can see in the photo, and he is as kind as he is tall. Even though he towers over us, in this cartoon, he drew himself as the same height. Ted keeps us laughing. When Noodlehead Nightmares came out, he sent us this picture. That picture inspired us to make Halloween costumes. We're going to tell you a couple of folk tales that were the inspiration for the fourth book in the series. Noodleheads, Noodleheads Fortress, Fortress of Doom. Doom. We'll read the beginning for you. Teacher said, we should try to fill our empty heads with knowledge. Sounds painful. Where do we get knowledge? Good question. Let's ask someone in here. Into the library they go, and out they come, each with a book. So there's knowledge in books? Who knew? Look at mine! Fortress of Doom! Here's mine, Big Book of Jokes. Now we fill our heads with these books full of knowledge? Oh. No, I think we read them. And the knowledge will fill our heads. Like magic. Oh, that's a relief. Hey, here's a joke. What is the tallest building in the world? I give up. The library. It has the most stories. I don't get it. Me neither. Knowledge is hard. Maybe your book is easier. Long ago, stories about fools were so popular that many places in the world had their own specific fool. For instance, in Puerto Rico, they told stories about Juan Bobo. In the Jewish culture, their favorite fool was Shlemiel. This story is about Italy's favorite fool, Jufa. If ever there was a fool in this world, that was Jufa. He lived in a small village in Italy long ago. Jufa always tried to do the right thing. Unfortunately, his idea of the right thing was so ridiculous that it usually got him into a, a lot of trouble. One day, Jufa got a job with the local goldsmith. On his first day of work, the goldsmith said, Jufa, I must leave now to go do an errand. Now, there's a lot of valuable things here in my store. Your job is simple. While I'm gone, please guard the door. This was Jufa's very first job, and he wanted to please the goldsmith, so he said, Oh, sir, you can count on me. I will guard the door very carefully. Excellent. However, when the goldsmith returned, there was no sign of Jufa or, or the, the door. door. The store was wide open. Just up the street, the goldsmith noticed a crowd of people. They were watching actors put on a show. There was Jufa in the crowd with, with the door, door on his back. back. Oh, the goldsmith was furious. He rushed over and said, Jufa, what are you doing? Didn't I tell you to guard my store? Instead, you left it wide open. Why, thieves, they could have stolen everything. Oh, 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 but sir, you never told me to guard the store. You told me to guard the door. And here it is, safe and sound. Oh, I've guarded very carefully. Uh, yes, I suppose you have. <laughs> so much for Jufa's job with the goldsmith. That was his first day and his last. This story is an old one from India, and it's about a husband and wife 
Now, in addition to all these 40 years of working together as storytellers, we've been married for most of that time as well. And if we were like the husband and wife in this story, I don't know if we would have lasted 40 minutes together. At the end of the story, you'll see a small clip of us telling this same story to a group of children in India. Although their English is very limited, you can see that they still enjoy the tale by watching our faces, hearing our voices, and our body movements. Long ago in India, there lived a husband and wife who were both extremely stubborn. One evening, the two of them were sitting in their living room when a cold gust of wind blew their front door open. Wife, get up and shut the door. Husband, get up and shut it yourself. I didn't open it. I'm not going to shut it. Well, I didn't open it either, and I will certainly not shut it. Both of them folded their arms over their chests, furious with the fact that the other one would not get up and shut the door. The icy wind howled. The storm swirled about their cottage. But the two of them just sat there, their teeth chattering and their fingers turning blue from the cold. Wife, I worked hard all day long in the fields. My feet are tired. Now please get up and shut the door. Husband, do you think that the house was cleaned, the dinner cooked, and the cow milked while I was lying down? My feet are tired too, so you get up and shut the door. Both of them knew that this argument could go on forever. And finally, in hopes of putting an end to it, the husband said, All right. You don't want to get up? I don't want to get up. You don't want to shut the door? I don't want to shut the door. Let's make a deal. Let's sit here without talking. The first one who speaks will have to get up and shut the door. That suits me just fine. So they both got comfortable and sat there in complete silence. Now, those two had been so caught up in their argument that they had not noticed a stranger lurking outside their front door. This man, who was a thief, had happened to walk by and noticed the door standing wide open in the middle of a storm. So after he overheard their argument and the bet that they had made about staying silent, the thief was pretty sure he was going to be able to profit from their foolishness. So he walked in boldly and stood right in the middle of their living room. Neither the husband nor the wife said a word. And the thief thought to himself, this is going to be easier than I thought. These two must be complete noodleheads. He went up to the kitchen table, took the lid off a jar, reached in, took out a cookie, and tasted it. Neither the husband nor the wife said a word. Since the cookie was delicious and the jar was full of them, he put the entire jar into his sack. <laughs> then he went around the cottage cheeking whatever he pleased. Tattered tablecloth, a broken cooking pot, a ragged quilt from their bed. Just my luck. I find two fools who let me take anything that I want. And wouldn't you know, there's nothing worth taking. Just then, the thief walked over and opened a chest of drawers, inside of which he saw a beautiful wooden box. It had intricate carved designs. This was the only thing of value the couple owned. It had the little money that they had to their names inside. Now, just as the thief opened the drawer, both the husband and wife stood up and at exactly the same time shouted, Don't you dare touch that! The thief, as you might imagine, was startled by their sudden response, but he still managed to grab that box, shove it into his sack, and bolt out the door. But do you think the husband or wife set off after the man who now had all their money? Oh no. Instead, the her husband turned to his wife and said, Aha! I knew it! You spoke first, now go and shut the door. What? You were the first one to speak. You shut it. Not on your life. Oh, admit it. You lost. You shut it. You shut it. You shut it. You, you shut, shut it. it. Those two may have settled their argument by now. On the other hand, 
That door may yet be opened. For the last we heard, they were still arguing. A deal. The first one who talks has to get up and shut the door. So they got comfortable and sat there in complete silence. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we'd tell another Noodlehead story since this is sort of all about Noodleheads. This is a very atypical Noodlehead story. For one thing, in the book, we're not going to tell it like this, but in the book, the woman is actually the Noodlehead. I, much to my amazement and disbelief, almost every story we found about fools was about men. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So I just and, and, but when we started to learn it and for telling, we found that Mitch is just a better noodle head. You know, he's, he's funnier than I am. It just, anyway. So. <laughs> but this is a, they, they're, they're noodle head. He's a noodle head in his own particular way to sort of stubbornness. So it's not your typical noodle head ploy. And uh, this story comes from uh, sort of northern Europe, I yeah, guess. Yeah, if any kids want to come and get right in the middle here, so you There was once a man who loved to argue. No matter what anyone else said, he would always say the opposite. No, I don't. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Now, as a result, the people who lived in his village, they tried to look the other way when they saw him coming because they knew they would be in for some kind of argument if he simply walked into the butcher shop to buy some meat there would be an argument because the butcher might say oh i've got some delicious lamb chops today no 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 today i want pork chops if he went to buy some bread and the baker said oh smell this delicious crusty italian bread just out of the oven now i'm in the mood for pumpernickel if he went to the farmer's market and the farmer said, oh, you must try some of these juicy carrots, especially good this year. Ah, uh, don't you have any turnips? It was his wife, of course, who had to put up with most of his foolishness. If she opened a window. He would shut it. If she shut he it. He would open it. If she said, oh, look at that duck out in our backyard. That, that's not a duck. That's a chicken. <laughs> even argued about the weather if she noticed oh goodness it's raining out today what are you talking about it it's snowing for sure <laughs> it was especially hard because you see the two of them they owned a farm and they ended up doing a lot of the work together one day they went out to look at the cornfield and the woman said hmm you know it looks as if the corn's going to be ready to harvest by uh, wednesday no it won't be ready until at least Thursday. Okay, Thursday, said the woman, trying to be agreeable. I'll get several of the older kids in the village to come and help us harvest. I know you won't. We'll do it ourselves. Okay, doing it ourselves, that'll be good after all. It will save us some money. And another good thing, the weather's going to be perfect. Oh, I can tell it's going to be beautiful. Oh, it's going to be miserable. It's going to rain for sure. I can feel it in my boat. At this point, the woman was beginning to lose her patience. Dear, let's not argue over every little detail. Whether we harvest the corn on Wednesday or Thursday, whether we do it ourselves or get some of the kids to help, whether it's rainy or sunny, there certainly is one thing we can agree on. We will cut the corn with size. No, this year for a change, I've decided we'll cut the corn with scissors. <laughs> At this point, the woman blew her top. Scissors, have you gone mad? No one harvests corn that way. Why, if we cut the corn with scissors, we are going to have to bend over and cut one stalk of corn at a time. But if we use the long, sharp blade of a scythe, why, we can cut a whole big section of corn with one swing. We will cut the corn with scythe. You heard me the first time. We'll cut the corn with scissors. Scythe. Scissors. Scythe. Scissors. Scythe. At this point, the husband was so angry, he turned to leave. But as he did, he tripped over a rock and landed right in the river, which went alongside their cornfield. Now her husband, he was not a good swimmer, so she rushed to try and save him. But when his head came up above the water, 
that man was too stubborn to call out for help. Instead, he kept on arguing. Scissors, he shouted. <laughs> Sighs, his wife yelled back at him just before his head went below the water. He came up a second time, called out, Scissors! Sighs, she shouted before his, he again went below the surface. He came up one last time, but this time his mouth was so full of water, he couldn't say a word. All that his wife could see was his hand above the surface and his fingers going, snip, snip, as if he allowed sinners. <laughs> then he was gone. Oh, that stubborn man, what a bull-headed man. What could the woman do? She decided at this point the best thing to do was to rush back to the village and get several of the neighbors to try and help her find her husband. And they looked all along the edge of the river, but he was nowhere to be seen. But one of the neighbors said, we're not using logic. If the rivers carry him away, he'll be downstream naturally. That's the way the river flows. So they went to look for him downstream, but again, he was nowhere to be found. Just at that point, the woman said, oh, wait a minute, it's true. Anyone else would go downstream with the current, but not my husband. Oh, no, he's bound to do the opposite. He's going upstream for sure. Well, they went to look for him, and sure enough, there he was, going against the current. And what's more, that stubborn man was just about to head straight up a waterfall. With one last shout of, Scissors! He disappeared over the top of the waterfall and was never seen again. <laughs> We were once telling that story for an audience quite like this, all big stages, and there was a really young girl. Maybe like a three-year-old, and she was right at our feet. Right at our right feet, here. and when I said, and he was never seen again, we could hear her say, Go! <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, she already knows someone like that. How horrible. <laughs> We hope that you've enjoyed the stories we told you today. We wish that we could see your faces right now. Those faces are what has kept us telling stories for 40 years. During a live performance, we look out and there is a sea of faces and sometimes a total stillness and hush. It is so much fun to tell stories. We hope that we've inspired you to read a lot more stories and to try telling them. You can start with the ones we told you today. And make up and tell your own stories. Thanks, Thanks for listening. listening.